Good morning, everyone. Good morning for us, and I guess it's good afternoon for uh, your time. Um, uh, thank you for introduction, and we will be discussing today gestational diabetes, uh, which is a um, wonderful topic to talk about, and um, I have nothing to disclose. So we will discuss historical facts and definition of gestational diabetes. We will talk about screening and diagnostic criteria of gestational diabetes. Uh, we will also discuss pathophysiology of gestational diabetes, how to manage it, and how to manage this women postpartum after they deliver. Uh, our goal today is to learn about, uh, again, definition and diagnostic criteria for gestational diabetes, learn about the main defects in insulin production and insulin action that we see in gestational diabetes, learn about how to diagnose it, uh, about the old ways and the new ways to diagnose it, uh, learn about therapy for gestational diabetes, when to initiate insulin, and um, is there a role for oral medications? And we will learn about safety, also, as I said, recommendations about the use of oral medications and um, about the postpartum um, check of those women. So first, we'll discuss historical facts and definition of gestational diabetes. So I will start with a case report that goes back to 1823. Uh, uh, when the patient was admitted to the Berlin uh, Infirmary with, um, she was seven months pregnant. She had, as was described in the chart, a really unquenchable thirst. She consumed more than six Berlin measures of beer or spring water, and her quantity of urine greatly exceeded the amount of liquids that she consumed. So at that time, um, the physicians did not know what that was, and the treatment was given as 360 milliliters of venous blood withdrawal and high protein diet. Um, and um, subsequently, she went into obstructed labor, and the child died um, during the labor. The baby was described as such a robust and healthy, whom you would have. But Hercules had been gotten. So the baby's weight was 12 pounds. So this was the first case report of women who had diabetes during her pregnancy and was not treated. Subsequently, the definition was established by Dr. Frankel and his team in Chicago. Um, the, main, the first definition was a carbohydrate intolerance of varying severity with onset or being first recognized during pregnancy. At the symposium in 1978, uh, Dr. Frankel stated that the period of intrauterine development presents an interval in which nurture, as exemplified by the character of maternal fuels, may influence the nature as represented by intrinsic genetic endowment of the fetus. So that was uh, kind of the first mention and the first definition, official definition of gestational diabetes and recognition of it. Um, gestational diabetes can be heterogeneous. Uh, it can represent <laughs> um, incipient type 2 diabetes. It can be pre-existing type 2 diabetes that recognized at conception. It could be as incipient type 1 diabetes that was not recognized prior to pregnancy, or um, it can be newly avert type 1 diabetes precipitated by pregnancy, or it could be true gestational diabetes. So all those um, type of diabetes can be first seen and recognized um, during the pregnancy. So what is the incidence of gestational diabetes? According, according to World, Her a World Health Organization, diabetes may be the most frequent metabolic pathological complication influences the fate of pregnant women and her baby. Gestational diabetes complicates about anywhere from different studies. Um, there are different uh, percentages reported. 
um, but in, on average, anywhere from 2 to 12 percent of all pregnancies. In the United States, uh, the average uh, incidence is about 4 percent, um, and it varies depending on the ethnic population. Um, it's less in white and uh, blacks. It's um, high in Hispanics. It's highest among Chinese uh, descendant leaving California. And it's uh, high 14% in Indians. Screen and diagnose uh, gestational diabetes. So, and who to screen? Uh, gestational diabetes risk assessment should be done at the first prenatal visit. Patients who are or women who are low risk uh, include those who um, do not need routine testing if all of the criteria that listed below are present. And what are those criteria? Um, if the member of um, ethnic group with a low prevalence of diabetes, not the ones that we just looked at with a high prevalence of diabetes. If there is no known diabetes history in the first degree relatives, if woman is under the age of 25 years old, if the weight is normal before pregnancy, so if the woman not overweight, um, if uh, we do have history of weight at birth and that was normal, and if there is no personal history of any abnormal glucose metabolism prior to pregnancy, and if there were prior pregnancies, no history of poor uh, or outcomes, obstetric outcomes or any complications. So those women do not need to have routine testing. Um, for average risk person, uh, the uh, performing blood tests, blood glucose, and special testing needs to be done at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation uh, using the old way of diagnosing um, the gestational diabetes is a two-step procedure. Uh, we used to do it for many years, and um, there are still a lot of hospitals in the United States that are still following this old rule, and that's why I wanted to mention that here. So the first step is to do a one-hour oral glucose tolerance test. That includes 50 gram of glucose challenge, uh, followed by um, a blood glucose to be uh, tested in one hour. Um, so that step performed in, used to be done in all women between the age of 24 and uh, 28 weeks of gestation, gestational age. Uh, and I will talk more about uh, the subsequent testing. Um, women who are at high risk for developing diabetes, the test should be performed as soon as feasible if one of the most, uh, one or more of the uh, following criteria present. If woman is obese, severely obese, um, if there is a strong family history of type two diabetes or prior personal history with the previous gestations, um, history of gestational diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance or spilling glucose in the urine. If gestational diabetes is not diagnosed at that first visit, then testing should be repeated at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, as we discussed previously, or any times if sign or symptoms of high blood sugar develop, which would be increased thirst, urination, um, feeling more tired, fatigue, unexplained weight loss, um, and others. Um, so what are the old and new uh, screening tests as we talked about? So one hour and 50 gram glucose challenge um, done between 24 and 20 weeks of gestation. The threshold for that one hour glucose by different criteria is either 130 or 140. Uh, most groups still use 130. If screening test is positive, women were subjected to a 100 gram of glucose tolerance test, and it's a three hour test. Uh, sensitivity and specificity of this glucose uh, challenge test uh, for predicting of abnormal oral glucose tolerance test is 79 and 87% respectively. So again, glucose challenge test is the one hour and 50 grams. Uh, those are the criteria for um, different organizations that we have been using, and I have it listed in both millimole per uh, liter or milligram per deciliter. So I'm not sure which um, ones are you using in, um, in your institution. Um, 
so fasting glucose um i the most of the institutions used carpenter and costan criteria uh, which is fasting glucose less than 95 one hour for the uh three hour glucose test uh, tolerance test which is again you give a hundred gram of oral glucose challenge and then blood sugars measured every hour for three hours for the first hour it's 180 or above two hours is 155 or above in three hours 140 milligram per deciliter or above um, so those are the tests again that the two-step test uh, we use we still use actually at Stanford we our OB uh, doctors and high-risk OB clinic they got so used to this two-step system that they're still using it but um, the recommendations for a new diagnostic criteria is to perform a two-hour 75 gram diagnostic test and that involved uh, uh, giving a 75 gram of glucose. So this is just one step. So there is no uh, first step with a 50 gram of glucose. So it's all done in one procedure. So women get um, 75 gram of oral glucose load and glucose checked in one hour fasting, one hour and two hours. And again, you can see the criteria of diagnosing for diabetes is fasting over 95. Um, one hour over 180 and a two hour is over 155. Um, <laughs> so we'll talk about then the next step will be to talk about pathophysiology of gestational diabetes. Um, pregnancy is a very um, interesting physiologic state where um, a lot of processes that um, normally happen in a non-pregnant woman changing uh, because women has now a little one to take care of inside the uterus and uh, supply with all the nutrients uh, for the duration of the pregnancy so therefore pregnancy has this uh, for in terms of the glucose metabolism is characterized by this um, term that's called accelerated starvation which means that glucose being utilized way more uh, way faster than um, in non-pregnant state. Um, so if glucose is utilized faster, then um, what happens with the body when the body, the brain still needs the glucose, the baby still needs the glucose. So there is an earlier switch from carbohydrate, which are um, supplies have been exhausted, um, to the um, fast, uh, to the uh, switch to uh, breaking down the protein and fat. And um, that's called facilitated metabolism. Sorry, facilitated metabolism in the fed state and then accelerated starvation in the fasting state. So what that means again is that body starts breaking down protein and fat faster um, earlier than normally. So normally if we fast overnight for 10 to 12 hours in the morning, our body breaks down some protein and fats to make the glucose uh, via uh, gluconeogenesis in the liver, it happens way faster in pregnancy. <laughs> uh, babies are um, working like our second brain. So they are getting all the glucose, um, no matter even if mom's glucose is low. Um, so glucose uptake by the fetus is about six milligram per kilogram per minute. Um, so they, uh, babies do get consumed quite a bit of sugar for energy. Um, and as you can see on the graphs in the fed state, in the red line, this is for uh, diabetes, um, for just normal, uh, sorry, normal pregnancy um, without diabetes. You can see that there are higher spikes post meal and there are lower drops on the blood sugar in the red um, in between the meals. Um, so mom's hepatic glucose production in the fasting state needs to increase by 14 percent um, so um, pregnant women uh, when they wake up with normal pregnancy in the morning uh, having ketones in the urine it's very common because of that accelerated starvation phase uh, and process how do babies get the glucose um, the glucose is transported by diffusion through concentration gradient um, and it's uh, 
saturable. So the more uh, mom's glucose um, has, the more gets transferred to the baby un um, until it's saturated. Placental glucose transporters are insulin independent and they allow bidirectional transport um, and uh, there are a total of four glucose transporters. GLUT1 is one of the transporters that is expressed in placenta. And GLUT1 uh, density or um, uh, the number of the GLUT1 um, transporters in the uh, basal membrane os of the syntetrothrophoblast is twofold higher in diabetes women. So it takes a higher um, glucose in the blood to saturate this transporter. So it's still more glucose being transported to the baby um, in women with diabetes. Insulin, does that penetrate to the baby? So it's not. Uh, human placenta is not um, allowing the insulin, free insulin to uh, penetrate through the placenta. It can transfer if a person has anti-insulin antibodies and when it forms a complex with anti-insulin antibodies, which is not that common nowadays. It used to be more common when we, uh, many years ago, used to use pork and beef insulin. Um, and again, um, so the magnitude of this transfer of insulin depends on the maternal concentration of those anti-insulin antibodies, which is usually not um, that much in gestational diabetes specifically. How insulin is produced in normal pregnancy. So studies have shown that in normal pregnancy, the body increases the insulin production. And as you can see on the graph and with the bars, um, even with the late gestation, uh, there is a three and a half fold increase um, in the first and third, uh, and the, um, first and second and third trimesters of the pregnancy of the insulin. So as gestational age uh, progresses, there is more insulin produced by the body to compensate for the state of insulin resistance. This is a normal physiologic process. Um, so as I mentioned in the previous slides, the uh, pregnancy um, is a state of insulin resistance that usually starts in about 14 weeks and then progresses as the pregnancy progresses. Um, when there were studies looking at the degree of the insulin resistance, um, they showed that it's 56% decrease, decrease in sensitivity to insulin uh, from before conception uh, through 34 to 36 weeks of gestation. And 39% of this decrease occurs between the weeks of, uh, by, uh, the week of 12 and 14, and then majority of that decrease, 61%, happens in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. Um, so what are the defects in pregnancy with diabetes that uh, contributes to development of diabetes? Uh, women with gestational diabetes have defects in insulin action, but not only insulin action, there is a decrease in insulin production. So the body is not able to compensate for normal state of insulin resistance during the pregnancy. Again, in normal pregnancy, there is a threefold increase in the insulin production during the first phase of the insulin production comparing to non-pregnant. And also three phase increase in the second phase and the more prolonged phase of insulin production uh, post meal uh, than in non-pregnant state. In gestational diabetes, um, in the first phase, there is a 25% less release of the insulin in the uh, uh, first phase, the quick release of the insulin, and 50% decrease uh, of non-pregnant uh, women, of normal pregnant women in the second, uh, trimester, second phase of the insulin release. Um, and that you can see uh, on the table how beta cells become uh, less responsive um, to the effect of the insulin resistance and produce less insulin in gestational diabetes to compensate for this degree of insulin resistance. Um, 
again, the insulin uh, production um, declined significantly during gestation, and um, you can see that on the bars um, as we discussed previously. So the babies of uh, diabetes mother, um, as you um, um, know that the babies, the main, um, one of the main complication is macrosomia or large babies. So the low picture that I have is classic appearance of the large, puffy, fatty, uh, limp infant of the diabetes mother who is not well controlled with diabetes during the pregnancy. Um, you can see that baby has prominent fat pads over the upper back and around the lower jaw. There is uh, a term as disproportionate macrosomia, meaning that there is an increased weight for length ratio and incidence of macrosomia can be normal pregnancies without diabetes as well, but it's 8% in general population comparing to 26% in women with diabetes. When does baby's pancreas start to function and produce insulin? It starts developing as early as 10 weeks of gestation and it becomes fully vascularized and functional around 16 weeks of gestation. Percent of islet cells in the baby um, at birth positively correlated with the birth weight. In early pregnancy, um, the proteins, the amino acids, more important stimulus for the beta cells. But uh, glucose becomes a critical factor in late pregnancy and near term. Um, insulin growth factor one and two are actively synthesized by babies by fetal pancreas and um, increased beta cell replication um, in the baby's pancreas. And insulin increases um, release of both insulin growth factor one and two. Uh, so that um, makes kind of a concern and suspicion for what will happen with those babies of diabetes mothers after they're born and will they be predisposed for diabetes, which we're gonna touch base on later on. Um, it had been shown that expression of insulin growth factor two in placenta and maternal blood are elevated um, in pregnancies with diabetes. So unfortunately, uh, babies uh, of diabetes mothers are actually affected um, during their um, sort of their nature, neutral environment um, during the pregnancy. There were several studies looking at the effect. Uh, one of the larger studies looked at uh, the babies um, at, by the age of 17 years old. And third of this uh, ODM stands for offspring of diabetes mothers have had evidence already at the 17 years of age of some prediabetes uh, with impaired glucose tolerance or even type 2 diabetes. Occurrence of impaired glucose tolerance test was associated with a higher amniotic fluid insulin concentration, uh, meaning that the baby's pancreas or beta cell are replicate faster, right, because of better fact of the extra insulin and um, produce more insulin into the amniotic fluid. Um, those babies already by the age of 17 had higher systolic diastolic blood pressure and mean arterial pressures, uh, which um, again, normally we don't see in a 17 year old kids. Um, so what are the recommendations for diet for gestational diabetes? Um, overall, um, chelary, uh, the percent of ideal body, depending on the percent of the ideal body weight, um, how many calories, kilocalories per kilogram um, would be recommended for um, pregnant women. So if women is underweight, less than 80% of the ideal body weight, then it's 40 kilocalories per kilogram per uh, weight recommendations. If the women is normal uh, weight, 80 to 120%, it's 30 kilocalories per kilogram. If women is overweight or um, even more, more than 150% over weight, it's 12 um, kilocalories, so limited calorie diet during the pregnancy. So the overall carb and protein and fat distribution is important during the pregnancy. And the current recommendations are for the, specifically for gestational diabetes, to have uh, overall carbohydrate content of diet is 
40% of total calories, daily uh, amount of calories. And the distribution of those carbohydrates would be lower for breakfast, less than 40, 45%, um, less for lunch, uh, so more for lunch, 55%, and 50% for dinner. Uh, the snacks in between the meals are important. So those, uh, this data um, for the percentages and the grams of carbs, um, a little bit old data. But in um, 2019 this year, um, in American Diabetes Association published uh, the recommendations for um, reduce actually uh, carb amount during the pregnancy uh, because there are studies showing that um, 175 grams, and we used to say 225 grams would be minimum. Now we have studies showing that 175 grams per day during pregnancy is a safe amount and babies developing normally with this amount of carbs. So this is, those are the new recommendations for ADA in 2019. Having um, 175 grams of carbs per day with a minimum of 71 gram of protein and 28 grams of fiber per day. How do we manage women with diabetes during pregnancy? So we talked about um, the caloric requirements and in this table I listed the recommendations for weekly uh, weight gain during the pregnancy depending on the BMI for pre-body mass index pre-pregnancy. Um, and and uh, the rate of weight gain is uh, listed as kilograms per week. Um, so if woman is underweight, the recommendations gain about um, half a kilo or one pound per week. Uh, for normal weight is a little less than a pound or 0.42 kilos per week. For overweight and obese women, uh, it's 0.28 and 0.22 uh, kilograms per week of the weight uh, gain recommendations. So how do we monitor uh, women and what do we use as a criteria for um, uh, the successful therapy during the pregnancy? So our data comes from this largest international study uh, that called HAPO or stands for Hyperglycemia and Adverse Pregnancy Outcomes. It was the huge study looking at 23,000 women. It was in 15 medical centers in nine countries. Mean age of women was 29 years old. And again, this woman underwent the new testing, which is for gestational diabetes, which is a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test that was administered between the ages of 24 and 32 weeks of gestation. The main outcome was birth weight over 90th percentile for gestational age, primary cesarean section, neonatal hypoglycemia, and poor blood C-peptide over 90th percentile. The secondary outcomes included delivery before 37 weeks, so premature delivery, shoulder dystocia, or birth injury, need for a neonatal intensive care unit, high bilirubin in the babies, and preeclampsia in moms. The frequency of each outcome increased with increased in maternal glucose, of level, uh, of glucose levels. Uh, so it was ranging from 5.3% in the lowest glucose uh, level group to 26.3% for birth weight over 90th percentile in the highest uh, glucose categories. And you can see in the table, uh, what were the mean numbers for uh, one hour, two hours from the lowest to the highest um, blood sugar categories. So, <coughs> um, uh, the results again of those studies showed that the <coughs> highest um, Rate, as you can see, the, uh, the risk ratio for uh, complications were in um, most of those were with one hour postprandial glucose. So that was birth weight was a uh, risk of one point increased by 1.46 fold, um, core blood glucose 1.46, um, and uh, higher neonatal hypoglycemia. So that was one of the reasons um, that um, the, we confirmed that 
we use to monitor for pregnancy one hour post meal blood glucose. So again, this uh, study confirmed that one hour post meal blood glucose, if we count at the onset of the start of the meal, is slightly, slightly more important maybe than the fasting glucose. And that's what is being used for the monitoring. Um, so based on that study, on this HAPO study, the newest recommendation of hyperglycemia diagnosis during the pregnancy is again to do a 75 gram two hour glucose test. Um, the, as you can see that based on the study, the glucose numbers, the glucose levels uh, for um, a diagnosis of pregnancy lower than they were in the previous criteria, slightly lower. For fasting plasma glucose, as you remember, it was 95. It was lower to 92. For one hour plasma glucose, it stays the same as 180. And for two hours, just a minor drop from 155 to 153. And those are the current recommendations that are used um, for American Diabetes Association. So when do we initiate therapy uh, for this woman? So for fasting glucose, if the venous glucose is over 95 and one hour of the postprandial glucose uh, over 140. So those are the recommendations. Um, the recommendations are to start first with the di dietary um, therapy but uh, for ADA uh, practice recommendations, if dietary management does not consistently maintain, maintain fasting glucose less than 95 or a one hour postprandial less than 140 on two or more occasions within one to two weeks, then insulin therapy should be considered. So as you can see, the criteria are very strict. So or even if there are one to two numbers in a one week of diet interval are over the target, then um, the therapy, insulin therapy should be considered. And this is all because the pregnancy has a limited uh, time for the um, intervention, right? So if you delayed for too long, then you already develop complications of pregnancy. So it's important to diagnose and start treatment early. Um, can we use only insulin or can we try oral medications? So that, this is the, still the subject of a huge debate. And in the United States, there are some institutions that are uh, accepting the risks of the use of the oral medications and uh, using oral medicine in some uh, women who are difficult to monitor with the insulin treatment. But what are our data for the use of oral medications for uh, gestational diabetes? Glyburide is one of the sulfonylureas or secretagogue medication that we use in type 2 diabetes management, have been studied in uh, gestational diabetes. It does penetrate through the placenta to the, uh, to the baby, and uh, it showed that 70% of maternal glyburide level was found in the cord blood. Um, there are no long-term studies uh, of those children who are um, exposed to library during pregnancy. Um, and, uh, about up to 16% of women who were on glyburide um, still required insulin uh, to achieve glycemic control during pregnancy. So they, had, they tried the glyburide first um, and then switched to insulin or added insulin. So there was less, less of the time to, to achieve adequate control. Um, so ADA, FDA recommendations to stop the um, uh, glyburide two weeks prior to delivery because of the very long um, effect and possible severe hypoglycemia in the babies when they're born. Um, therefore, those women still need to be switched to insulin for two weeks prior to delivery. And uh, there are some non-blood sugar lowering effects that were reported, which is the inhibition of placental arterial vasoconstrictions. Um, and possible impact of growth on endothelial cells and some others. So the consensus was that adoption of glyburide may be premature. There are high rate of macrosomia, large babies, and high rate of uh, low blood glucose um, in the kids, in the babies that are born with the treated with glyburide. Uh, for, what about metformin? We're usually saying metformin is a safe drug and it's okay to use it. Uh, so what is the data? 
um, several studies um, showed that women who were treated with metformin during the pregnancy, um, about 10 to 14 percent of this women required insulin still to be added. So the control was not adequate. Uh, kidney clearance in middle and late pregnancy is 49 and 29 percent higher comparing to postpartum. And maybe that's contributing to the less of the effectiveness of the drug during pregnancy. There is a placental transfer to the, to the fetus. Uh, fetal concentration of metformin was similar to the mom's concentration, but um, so far no major adverse outcomes were reported. Um, there was no association between use of metformin in the first trimester and risk of congenital malformations in the baby. Um, there actually have been shown that the rate of the large babies or macrosomia uh, comparing to insulin was less. Um, and there was less of the maternal weight gain, which is expected, and less of the gestational hypertension, and less of the uh, baby's hypoglycemia with the use of the um, metformin. Um, some other studies looking at um, two years outcome after the babies are born um, showed that some of the babies had small uh, ventricular septal defect and atrial septal defect. Um, there was a higher incidence of unilateral cleft lip in the informing group, uh, but those patients were enrolled at 20 weeks where the, um, the baby, they already all the formation of the major organs already happened, which uh, makes it less likely to be associated with metformin and more likely just to be with poorly controlled diabetes. Um, the latest review of all the studies still came to the conclusion that there is insufficient high quality evidence of recommending one medication versus the other uh, during the pregnancy. And choice should be based on mom's and physician preference and severity of diabetes. Um, in 2008, uh, 2018, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine uh, published the statement uh, about the use of the oral medications because there's so much debate in the literature and in the clinical practice. And they emphasize that long-term metabolic effect of offspring exposed in utero to oral hypoglycemic agents is not uh, well studied, it's not less well known than to insulin. Insulin, we know that it does not cross the placenta. Metformin is a reasonable alternative to insulin, but Half of the women may require insulin um, during the uh, pregnancy for adequate control. American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist um, came just um, at the end of last year with a statement that non-insulin therapies should be reserved for women who are unable or unwilling to take insulin, but otherwise insulin should be still a preferred treatment. And in 2019, in January, just last, uh, or um, two months, we're already in March, uh, um, for American Diabetes Association statement, uh, publications uh, says that metformin and glyburide should not be used as first-line agent as they both cross the placenta to the fetus and oral um, data on oral uh, agent lack of long-term safety data. Metformin, when used for treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome or induction of the ovulation, should be discontinued when pregnancy has been confirmed. So this is the latest recommendation. And again, the pract in practice, um, it's very, very variable on um, what's done across institutions. But those are the recommendations from all three societies that I mentioned here. So how do we take care of postpartum for of those women? So what are the recommendations? Because women who had gestational diabetes during the pregnancy are at a very high risk to develop overt diabetes after the delivery. And we know that about 50% of women who had gestational diabetes during pregnancy will have um, um, overt diabetes um, within the next three to five years. So how do and when do we screen those women? For postpartum diabetes screening guidelines, uh, the recommendations are from National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, World Health Organization, and American Diabetes Association, as well as Canadian Diabetes Association, 
all agree on the testing, uh, but uh, the sort of recommendations are slightly different. So as you can see by uh, organization listed, that all agree that women had to be tested six weeks post delivery, postpartum. Um, when to test, each organization gives a lot of different recommendations, but um, for American Diabetes Association, if normal, then repeat every three to every three years. And if impaired fasting glucose was detected, uh, then to do the test annually. Um, which test to do? Um, so for American Diabetes Association, for World Health Organization and Canadian Diabetes Association all agree that um, 75 gram two hour glucose test is recommended to get done um, at six weeks postpartum to uh, diagnose this woman. The hemoglobin A1C test is not recommended because um, women, it reflects that three months um, uh, uh, diabetes control or blood sugar, average blood sugar, because women are only six weeks postpartum and there was effect of hemodilution during the pregnancy and some blood loss during the pregnancy, this test does not reflect the three months, so it will be falsely low at six weeks, at six weeks postpartum. Um, so what are the take home points? That oral glucose tolerance test of 75 gram with measuring of two hour glucose load as a standard for diagnosing gestational diabetes and has to be done in all women between 24 and 28 weeks of gestation unless they have pre-existing diabetes. Use of the euglycemic diet and monitoring for weight gain is very important. Insulin is the only approved treatment. Uh, there are debates on oral medication use, but they're not recommended. We don't have sufficient data. Um, and women with history of gestational diabetes who are at high risk for diabetes after delivery should get a screening oral glucose tolerance test at six weeks postpartum. Um, so I thank you for the attention, um, and I hope you um, all had a, um, a good um, kind of understanding now what the gestational diabetes, what kind of, um, you know, challenge it represents and how to diagnose and how to manage it. And um, please feel free to ask me questions. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Uh, uh, great slides and content. Uh, we will uh, stop the recording now and unmute Cameroon.